Uh, well, good evening. It's great to see, uh, to see you all out this evening. I'm Andrew Tedder, and I'm president of Simon Fraser University. And uh, before we begin, I would like to start by acknowledging that we are privileged to gather this evening on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples. Uh, and that, of course, reminds us of not only their tradition, but of the, the whole natural environment in which, uh, in which we are situated, which is important and related to the topic of tonight's lecture. Uh, let me welcome you to the uh, final lecture in the 2014-15 President's Faculty Lecture Series. And it's just so great to see so many of you out this evening. Uh, it really uh, makes it worthwhile for our faculty members to get this kind of uh, interest in their research. Uh, this is the second time we brought the faculty uh, lecture series to the Shabell Center for the Arts, and I think given this turnout tonight, we'll keep uh, doing so in the future. Uh, the whole idea is to present to you some of our best and brightest faculty members for an evening of uh, discussion around big ideas. And certainly tonight, uh, <laughs> this is why you shouldn't let presidents near technology. Um, this lecture series is part of uh, another big idea, a big idea for the university. SFU a few years ago uh, decided that we wanted to adopt a vision for the university to be Canada's most community engaged research university. You know, the image of universities has often been the ivory tower set apart from society. And we thought, what a shame. What a shame to take all this knowledge and the student experience and remove it from society. Let's really work uh, to connect it to society. And thankfully, at SFU, that's been happening for many more years before I arrived through our three campuses, through our faculty research endeavors in community, and through our co-op and other student programs. So uh, that vision of an engaged university inspired the idea of let's start bringing our faculty lecture series to the community so that you would have the benefit of hearing from some of our faculty members who are engaged in exciting research and they would have the privilege of uh, sharing that research with a new and, and broader audience and to get your feedback which uh, I think can be very affirming and exciting for them. Now there will be a chance uh, after the lecture to ask some questions and then we'll have a, a little bit of a, a modest reception, these being tough fiscal times, uh, a little bit of coffee and some cookies, but also a chance to talk amongst ourselves and to have a chance to talk uh, with our uh, speaker this evening. And I also want to just give you a note, if you do ask a question, uh, it'll probably end up uh, being filmed as part of the film of tonight's lecture because we want this lecture to be available to even a broader audience through our YouTube uh, channel. So, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Dr. Arna Moores. Dr. Moores is an evolutionary biologist and a professor of biodiversity in our Department of Biology. He's originally from Fredericton, New Brunswick, New Brunswick educated at McGill and Oxford with stints at UBC and the University of Amsterdam. Dr. Moores has held fellowships at both Yale University and the Berlin Institute for Advanced Study. His primary research interest is macroevolution, he produces family trees of organisms and then asks why some lineages are successful at speciating while others are not. He's published over 50 articles. He's a prolific researcher, uh, as well as book chapters on a fascinating range of issues about evolution and conservation, including the Canadian Species at Risk Act, international whaling, international spending on conservation, and even on how long mammals nurse their young. So very interesting and important issues. Uh, and very extensive uh, research that we're going to benefit from this evening. His most recent work considers how evolutionary theory might aid conservation biology. He's a collaborator in the EDGE program. That's a, an acronym. It stands for Evolutionary, ev ev Evolutionarily Distinctive and Globally Engaged. And it's the only conservation initiatives focused specifically on both threat and evolution. Dr. Moores is also active in public education, as some of you may have heard him on the CBC in the weekend. You may have seen the story in the sun. He's someone who uh, is dealing with important ideas and through tonight's lecture is going to ensure that those ideas are further shared with a broader audience. Um, he tonight has prepared a lecture on the very provocative and important topic, what to let go, making hard choices in the age of extinction. So please join with me in welcoming Dr. Anna Morse. So it's, it's a real honor. So this is the first time I've ever given a public lecture on my own work. So, um, and it might be silly to say so, but having a quote up there about playing God, but I hope this will be kind of fun in a deadly serious sort of way. 
And um, I want to start with this picture. This is a beautiful picture of flowers, plants, very special plants that only grow at the very tip of South Africa. Many of them are endangered, and they're all very beautiful. And the reason that I show this picture is because this was the eye grabber for this uh, editorial or this news story. Um, and, that's, and this is the news story that gave me the title. And it was called What to Let Go. And it was published back in 2007 when I was just starting. So I think I started thinking about this stuff seriously in the way that I'm going to describe it to you um, in about 2005. So it's been 10 full years. And this is a very pro provocative uh, story because it talked about triage in relation to conservation. And so the idea here, and the, tri the triage that they were thinking about was battlefield triage, right? That was what they wanted to evoke in people, this idea that sometimes you're just too far gone, don't waste your time on this soldier, let him die, and concentrate on that other soldier. And that's where I got uh, the title, Making Hard Choices in the Age of Extinction. So I'll tell you about the age of extinction, and I'll tell you just one small piece, one small way that might that we can, one small way we can use to help make choices. It's not the way to make choices, but it might help us make choices. And as you can see, lots and 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 lots of people have helped me, and I don't take credit for uh, all of these ideas or even most of these ideas, um, but they asked me to give the talk, so here I am. So, I'm going to start with this premise. And this is a quote from the very venerable evolutionary biologist E.O. Wilson, you may have heard of him, a professor at Harvard, emeritus. And in a book in 1992, he said that conservation, biological conservation's aim, not an aim, but the aim, should be the preservation of the information content contained in the DNA of all the species on Earth. So I'm going to try to unpack that uh, idea. Then maybe at the end we'll ask whether it's a good idea at all. Okay. So one of the, so people ask, you know, well, what motivates you in, in uh, doing your research? And one of the things I had to think about that. Um, one of the things that motivates me uh, is the fact that I go home to my my parents' farm where I grew up, and there just isn't as much stuff there that was there when I was a child. So these are all things that I saw as a kid or had as, even as pets, I had a woodchuck as a pet for a while, um, that just aren't there now on my mom's farm. So my, my daughter doesn't see these things. So the, the biodiversity of my mom's farm just isn't what it used to be. So they are gone from just that little piece of land outside Fredericton. But of course, that's not extinction. This is extinction. So these are the six uh, uh, birds and mammals that have gone extinct, uh, five of them officially, uh, in Canada since we've been keeping records. And the interesting thing is, just so you know, this is the Eskimo curlew. It used to be a very, very uh, uh, widespread bird. Hasn't been seen since 1963. Hasn't been seen down south since 1936. Still not declared extinct. You have to be, you have to be not seen for over 60 years before you're officially declared extinct. But we're pretty sure that it's extinct. So even here in Canada, um, there have been uh, extinctions. This is a, a sort of the recent global view of extinction. So this is from 2010. This is Hoffman and 150 other authors, uh, including some from uh, SFU. And for each, this is major groups. So these are amphibians, your sharks, your mammals, uh, your reptiles, one group of fish, and your birds. This is the total number of species that they looked at and this is the percent of species that they um, claim, this is the IUCN, so this is an international organization that does this for a living, claim are at risk of extinction, 40%, 30%, 25%. And on average, it's about, if you take all the species and add them all up, it's about 24% of all of those groups are considered to be at risk of extinction. So not green, but one of these more dramatic colors. Let's just take a look at um, this group, so that's us, the mammals. So the mammals, according to Hoffman and 150 other authors, 25% of those 5,000 species of mammal are at risk of extinction. If only 5% go extinct, not 
25%, just 5%, so one-fifth of those that they think are, are at risk, um, go extinct. In the next 500 years, so in, before 2500, we will lose 500 times more evolution than will be gained by all those other species evolving over those 500 years. And you can take out a piece of paper and you can do the sums and you'll see that that is the case. And obviously, if we assume, if we assume that 10% instead of 25% go extinct, then a thousand times more evolution will be lost if we lose those species. And that's based on the idea that every species we lose is on average about five million years old, right? So when we lose, a, when a species go extinct, we lose up to five million, or on average, five million years of evolution. Now, and then there's climate change. The Hoffman et al. paper, this is just looking at what they believe uh, are the numbers of species that are at risk now. People have spent just in the last few years, people have started to think, well, what's going to happen with climate change? Interestingly, the latest review from 2012 from a, a French group out of Grenoble um, looked at all the data, and it turns out that the climate change models predict, so this is a future prediction, these are not species that are necessarily at risk now, but that somewhere between 1 and 25 percent uh, of the species they looked at flowering plants, terrestrial vertebrates, and butterflies um, will be committed to extinction by the year 2100. That's a terrible ex number. They have no idea. One to 25%, 25 times. They, they really don't know what climate change will do, but the model suggests that it will do something in addition to everything else that we've done. So I think it's fairly clear that we can say that we are living in an age of extinction. And if everybody wants to challenge me on that, I'd be happy to discuss it uh, afterwards about making hard choices. Well, this idea of triage, which I pointed to in that 2007 story in Nature, which was um, quite influential on, on my thinking, that idea of triage has been around actually for quite a while. This is a front page uh, story from the New York Times from 1980. Some of you might not have even been born in 1980. Scientists urge triage for species believed Endangered, and the quote I put up, I put up about playing God comes from this um, this story. So the idea that we have to think about prioritization, either battlefield triage or just prioritization, which is not quite the same thing, um, has been around for a long time. So this isn't new. So you've all come here to, to hear me talk about something new. Actually, it's been around for quite a long time. Okay, now I said that the premise of the whole thing. You know, the whole reason I'm wearing a suit is that conservation's aim should be the preservation of the information content contained in the DNA uh, of all the species on Earth. So, talk is in two parts instead of three. I'm going to tell you how we might do that, putting the cart before the horse, and then I'm going to tell you why we might do that. Usually I do it the other way around, but I thought I'd do it this way. Because I'm going to pretend that that quote, because it's E.O. Wilson, is what we should do. Okay, so two things we have to do today. Turns out that this idea that I'm presenting to you is just a variation on Noah's Ark. So this is Noah releasing the dove, and this is a cartoon of Noah's Ark that I uh, like quite a bit. So it's kind of the Noah's Ark approach. Okay. The first thing we, need, we have to keep in mind, and first thing that's very important to think about, is that everything is related. All living things are related. They all come from a single or Life may have evolved many times, but everything that, that is alive on Earth today is related to everything else that's alive on Earth today. At least we have no evidence to the contrary. Everything is related. You're related to the mushrooms you had for dinner. Okay. How does evolution create the biodiversity that we see today? Well, evolution creates hierarch hierarchically arranged biodiversity. And to do that, because everything's related. So just to walk you through an example, we have a bonobo. It's closely related to the common chimp. They're both members of the same genus called Pan. So those are two, two members of Pan. There's humans. Uh, our closest relatives are actually uh, Neanderthals, but Neanderthals went extinct, so there's only us left. So we're the only member of that genus, Homo. Uh, there's two species now in the genus Gorilla, and there's actually two species in the genus uh, Pongo. So the Neanderthals have been around, and it would have been much more symmetrical, but for some reason they're gone. And all of these, living species are members of the same family, the family uh, hominidae. 
Now, how did that actually come about? Why do we have this sort of nested hierarchy uh, of relationships? Well, it's because a long time ago, sometime in the past, there was an ancestor, and this is the ancestor of the great apes. So this is one of the ancestors, or this is something that lived a long time ago that gave rise to lineages uh, that led to the great apes. And then through time, slowly, there was evolution and divergence. And there's evolution and divergence. And there was some extinction. Now, I just showed this one, one of the Neanderthals, but there were little extinctions all over the place here that we just don't see. But what we see is the relationships among the living species um, because of evolution and divergence. So evolution creates diversity via divergence through time. I just fix up the tree there. Now, I'm not going to give you a quote uh, that was given to me by a member that's actually a member of the audience, which is a, a, a very pithy way to think about what the tree is. The tree, which is this thing, which we can figure out by looking in the DNA of the creatures, actually represents shared information right there concerning solved evolutionary problems. So we're all around because that lineage solved a bunch of evolutionary problems. It didn't go extinct like nanothals, right? So the information that's in here, the time that this lineage was around, is information about a shared evolution, uh, about a solved evolutionary problem. And the tree also contains information about unique information. So this is shared information, and this is unique information concerning solved evolutionary problems. Right? So the tree can, it contains information about the information about solved evolutionary problems. And so the branch lengths, so these are called branches, and the branch lengths measured in time from, this is roughly 18 million years ago uh, up to now, actually represent change. And you can measure it as lapsed time. And with a little bit of leap of logic, we can actually suggest that maybe the branch lengths actually also measure Wilson's information content. Right? It's the information content in the DNA of all the organisms on Earth. Some of that DNA we share with our close relatives, and some of that DNA is unique to us. And likewise, for gorillas and for chimps. If so, then Wilson's recipe, right, that we should be preserving that information just means that we should preserve the tree. So if you preserve the tree, you preserve the information. So my thesis, right, pretend this is a defense, right? My thesis is that conservation is concerned with saving the tree of life. And that's what Andrew said, that's what I do for a living, so that's my hammer, here we go. We should, we should be saving the tree of life. So, here it is. If you only had three, if you, if you could only, if you had to actually do triage, you can only save three of those tips, which ones would you choose? Well, if we chose the two chimps and the gorilla, we're gonna be around, let's pretend we're here, let the other things go extinct, so we'll get rid of them, then that's how much of the tree that we would be saving, right? That's how much of the information that we would be saving. Alternative, alternatively, if we save one orangutan, uh, one gorilla, and one of the two chimps, and let the others go extinct, then that's how much of the, of the tree we would be saving. So we could save this much of the tree, or this much of the tree. And if you add up all the evolution, you'll find that this is the way to go if what you want to do is follow Wilson and save as much of the tree as possible. That is the Noah's Ark. That's what Noah did, because he took two of each species. He didn't take 20 elephants and no camels. He took two elephants, right? He took two of this and two of that and two of this and two of that to make sure he got as much of the tree as possible. That's what Noah did. That's what the story tells us. So Noah was following Wilson's admonition of what to do for conservation. And it's a smart thing to do. Makes sense. Unfortunately, we don't do conservation that way. We tend to focus on individual species. We don't say, we're going to look after this, and because we're looking after this, we're going to look after this, and because we're looking after this set of species, we're going to make sure we get this one and not that one. We have a list of species. Uh, we talk about species and Endangered Species Act. Conservation organizations worry about protecting particular species, and zoo breeding programs, something I'm interested in um, just recently, also thinks about species, individual species. What species do you bring in? What species do you deal with? And that means we need some way to assign a value to the species such that if we save those valuable ones, the ones that score highest, we will save as much of the tree as possible. That was, that's kind of the idea. So how do you do that? Well, my former graduate student did that. And he came up with a very simple way to assign value to a species 
such that if you save the most valuable ones, you would save a lot of the tree. And it's, it's extremely simple, but actually has a lot of really useful properties. So now we're going to give a measure to each one of our species. And we're going to say, OK, how much is this particular species? These are all females, actually. This is the only male. I had the queen there before, and I took it out and put Charlton Heston in. Because <laughs> I thought that might be a little bit much. So how much, how much, how much um, what value do we give this species? Well, we're going to say that species gets this much, all of its unique information, unique evolution, and half of this long branch. Now, there's been lots of extinctions here, but it's long branch. Right? That's how much it gets. Sister species, that's what's called, gets that much and that much, right? So they now have divvied up that part of the tree in terms of how much value we give them. Likewise, these two divvy up this part of the tree, they get this, they get half of this, and they get one, one, two, three, four, five, one fifth of the shared information. And likewise, we get all our own, we get one third of this, and the chimps get all the rest. Now the whole tree is colored in a rainbow, we've used up all the information and we've divvied it up amongst the species, right? So the species that are lonely get more and the species that have close relatives get less because they have to share it with everybody else. Very simple, works like a charm. And we can actually add it up. So these are, this is the actual, these are the actual numbers uh, as we've measured them on a big tree of um, mammals. Okay, turns out, let me make sure, yeah. Turns out that uh, if you do that and you use though that, those, that measure of isolation, so I'm talking about how isolated you are on the tree of life, then collectively, if you choose the most isolated ones, you actually get a lot of the tree. So if you choose eight species randomly, this is how much of the tree you'd get on average. Uh, if, let's say the whole tree is equal to one, you know, you get about 65%. If you actually use uh, David's way, you actually would get closer to 80%. So, it seems to work if, to, if, if the goal is to get as much of the tree as possible. Um, here are some isolated species. These are also called living fossils. So these are species that go way back, don't share a lot of evolution with other species, and they're all uh, pretty crazy. The coelacanth, the Australian lungfish, the tuatara, and this is roughly, we, don't, we haven't built good trees for these species, so we don't really know um, how much evolution they represent, but they represent on the order of hundreds of millions uh, of years of evolution that is not shared with anything else on the planet, right? So under my, under, it's not unique to me, but under this idea of thinking about value, these are valuable species. My favorite on this coast is the uh, coastal tailed frog. So there it is, it's quite a bit smaller. This is where it lives, it only lives here, it just comes into Canada, it has a very small range. It uh, has four relatives, they're all in New Zealand, Three of them are at risk of extinction. The other one is of conservation concern. And that little group of frogs is related to no other frogs on the planet. You have to go back hundreds of millions of years, just like with the orangutans. You've got to go way, way back before that little group of frogs hooks in to the rest of the tree of life. It's the only frog in North America that has a tail. It's not a real tail, but we call it a tail. Um, and it's the only frog uh, in North America that bears live young. Now the interesting thing is because all its close relatives are at risk of extinction, you could actually make the argument that this little critter here actually has genetic responsibility for relatives at higher risk of extinction, right? We should be very careful not to lose this species because who knows what's gonna happen with climate change and with other things that uh, tend to happen when humans get involved um, in New Zealand with amphibians, right? They could all get, they could get diseases and they could die. And if they all go extinct, and as I say, three of them are at, or two are critically endangered, then this is, would be the, lone, the only member of that group. Again, we don't have a particular, we have a tree for amphibians, it's not a particularly good uh, tree. So let's take a look at something that is a good tree. Let's look at a couple things. So this, I'm gonna get my prop out. So this is a tree, okay? This is a phylogenetic tree. So this is the past, and this is the present, right? And that might be humans over here, for instance, right? I've showed you this kind of tree. When it's a really, really big tree, we kind of open it up so that the past is kind of in the middle, and then you make a circle around the outside when you have a whole bunch of different um, species. So for instance, this is also a phylogenetic tree um, for all the mammals. 5,140 species. This is kind of what it looks like. Uh, so this is the past. 166 million years ago, so roughly 150 million years ago, going out to the present. And here you've got all the rodents, and here are the primates over here. 
right? And it goes all the way over here. So you can kind of follow up. Here's a, here's, here's a split, just like you saw between the orangutans and the gorillas, and then there's splits up through here. So we can actually calculate uh, on that tree. We can use um, Dave's measure of isolation and say, well, what's the most isolated mammal on the planet? What do you guys think? What's the most isolated planet, uh, mammal on the planet? Any ideas? Africa, it's the African aardvark. That's from the bush, that's a baby African aardvark. So they don't look quite that cute, but it's, that's what, the aardvark is number one, and it represents 88, let's say roughly 90 million years of evolutionary history, right? What's number two? Australia, absolutely. The Australian platypus, 80 million years. Now, there's lots of slop in that tree, so they might be tied for first place. But those are two species. They're very different from everything else. That's certainly different from everything else that you've ever seen. And that is different by virtue, partly, that it has no close relatives. What's another one that I like to talk about? The panda. So the panda is actually ranked 49th of all 5,000 species of mammal in the world. So we like the panda. It's pretty cute, and it eats only bamboo. Uh, it's a strange bear, sort of out, you know, distantly related to bears, and it is the 49th most isolated mammal. Okay, quiz. There's four Canadian mammals. Which one do you think is the most isolated, and which one do you think is the least isolated? Walrus. Do you all know what they are? I should say, do you all know what they are? So that's, that's a, you know what that is, walrus. You know what that is. That's a wolverine, right? And that's a, uh, uh, what's that? Oh yeah, polar bear. So, which one do you think is the most isolated? Polar bear, right? No, walrus. Actually, it's the beaver. Isn't it amazing that our Canadian uh, emblem is the most isolated, uh, one of the most isolated uh, mammals on the planet? 33rd, ranks number, top 50 out of 5,000. And the least isolated of these four is the polar bear, 1,000th, 25th percentile. Not so good. It's actually quite closely related to uh, brown bears or grizzly bears, right? They can even, they can even breed. I think they're called, does anyone know what they're called? Growl, growlers or prowlers or something, right? So the polar bear, and this actually is probably an overestimate. So the tree that we used, that we helped build back in 2007, former graduate student of mine, um, use the data from the 2000s, uh, th this, these guys may be even less isolated than uh, um, what I'm reporting here. Um, and my favorite northern uh, mammal is actually the walrus, which is 100. So 10 times, if you want to think about it, an order of magnitude more isolated on the tree of life than the polar bear. Okay. <clears throat> now, the past seven or eight years, I've been focusing on birds. This is the hoopoe. Uh, and we spent a lot of time building, just like we built for the mammals, but this was done with sort of uh, better technology, a tree of all the birds. So instead of having about 5,000 species, there's about 10,000 species. Uh, these, are all, these are all the songbirds all the way down here, so almost half of all birds are songbirds, and these are all the non-songbirds, and the chickens are over here, so the chickens are a member of a group. Um, and collectively, if you add up all the evolution, it's about 77 billion years. And you might have seen the mammal was about half, about 50 billion years. So they're, about, they're roughly the same age, actually, these two groups. So we worked really hard on that. And then what, I've done, what we've done here uh, with colleagues is that we've painted, you can't see, obviously I put, didn't put the names there because they're 10,000, but we've painted the, the branches by how isolated they are. So the hotter the color, the redder the color, the more isolated, they go way back. And the cooler the colors are the ones that are on short branches and have lots of close relatives. Right? So you can immediately see that there's some bits of the tree that are hot and some bits of the tree that are cold. That is tied, as I say, we don't, not sure, but that is tied uh, um, for being the most isolated bird on the planet. It's called the oil bird. It's actually a bat. It's not actually a bat, but it acts like a bat. So it lives in caves, it's colonial, it's nocturnal, it uses echolocation, and it only eats fruit. So it's like a fruit bat. Very strange, very isolated uh, member of the bird family. 
The other one that's tied um, is also in South, Af uh, South America. So that, that's South American. It's also a South American bird. It's called the Hoatzin. And the coolest thing about the Hoatzin, or one of the very cool things, is that its babies have hands. So it's a bird with hands. So I'm going to show you, hopefully this will work, I'll show you a little video. So there's a little baby. And they think they got the hands because they live in such wet, uh, uh, they live over streams, they nest near streams, that babies fall into the water a lot. And so they tend to come in and they use their hands to get out of the water. So you just see as it comes up there, it's a hand. That is the second most isolated bird on the planet. So the first one's a bat, and the second one is a uh, <laughs> bird with hands. Here's some other ones. The ostrich is, in the, is number 11. It might even be better than number 11. So since we published our paper the, in 2012, new data have come out that suggest that the ostrich might even be older um, than what we suggest. Uh, we have it ranked at 11. It might even be higher than that. I don't know whether they ever did this, but anyway. Bef before my time. Um, here are a few more. This is the secretary bird. It stands about this high, mostly leg, eats snakes, and it kills snakes by stepping on them. It lives in Africa. Uh, the shoebill, which looks like nothing else. The hammer cop, which looks like nothing else. Uh, and the red-throated loon, which actually lives in, in uh, northern Canada, uh, which ranks number 16. So I just put a few up. Put a few up. I'll put these up to make two points. The first is that all these are from Africa. And if we actually look to see where all these old uh, or isolated species are, this is someone asked where the mammals are, something in Australia. For birds, definitely the hot colors are where you see more of the, most, of the isolated species. The isolated species are not where we live. They are in Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and New Guinea. That's where the old isolated species are. Interestingly, we don't know why. So there's, there's a whole set of research questions about why. Um, but that's where they are. And the other interesting thing about these is I got these pictures off the web, as you can see. They're all from the web. These are from the zoo. A lot of the good pictures, because you get really close, of isolated species are from the zoos. And I thought, ah, I think isolated species are cool. Do we also think they're cool? Is it more, are you more likely to see an isolated species or not, or an unisolated species uh, in the zoo? And if you look at all the species that are kept in zoos, there actually is a significant difference in how isolated you are if, if you're in a zoo versus if you're not in a zoo. So these are species of bird that breed in zoos. And these are species of bird that are not yet found in zoos. And they are, on average, a little bit more isolated. Not a major effect, but um, something I want to continue to uh, look at. OK, well, that's the fun stuff. What about endangered species? So what, uh, what we've done here is all these little wisps out here refer to the point to the 575 most endangered species. Now what we can do is we can say, of those endangered species, which ones are isolated? First of all, we can ask, well, is isolation actually correlated with whether you're at risk or not? Luckily, it's not. So these are, the, these are isolated, these are, sorry, endangered species. And these are species that are not endangered, so most species are here. And it turns out that the average isolation is exactly the same, which is great news. It would be awful if the isolated ones were also the ones at risk of extinction. So we, it gives us time, at least. There's the most isolated one of the 575 that are endangered. This is the number uh, uh, two. This is number four. This is the plains wanderer. Sorry, this is the giant ibis. This is the kagu from New Caledonia, plains wanderer uh, from Australia, and the California condor. So the California condor, luckily, we saved the California condor because it is the fifth most isolated endangered bird. And we spent millions of people in the States spent millions of dollars saving it. They didn't know it was that isolated. Luckily, they did it. This one is number three, hasn't been seen since the 60s. There isn't even a picture of it. It's a New Caledonian outlet nightjar, also from New Caledonia. So France, which, run, which is in charge of New Caledonia, is in charge of two of the most isolated endangered birds on the planet. We can actually rank all the species. Don't, you don't have to read these, but there's the giant ibis, there's the kagu. This is how isolated they are, and this is the top 50 here. So they're going down from most to least isolated. And if we actually we should do this, maybe. If we actually said, OK, we're going to prioritize, right? We're going to save this one. Make sure we save this one before we save this one. Make sure we save that one before we save that one, all the way down the line. So instead of just looking at how endangered they are, we're also going to take into account how isolated they are. That, and so here you save the, here you save the uh, giant ibis, then you save the kagu, then you save the new Cal night jar if you could find it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to 575. That's going this way, number of species saved. And you say, well, how much of the tree do we save if we do that? Because remember, the whole point is to do what Noah did and save as much of the tree as possible. 
Turns out that using that metric of isolation, we do almost as well as we could do if we did it optimally. Right? The difference there is not very much. And much better than if we did it randomly. Don't worry about the tree. All those different squiggly lines just refer to different trees. I said we, we don't really know what the tree is. We just tried it on a bunch of different trees, possible trees. So that seems to work, at least in theory. OK. So this is one way that we can focus on species and still do what Noah did. Second question is, why might we do this? Well, one reason is because this venerable old gentleman told us to. And you laugh, but I was a grad student, and I'm reading this book called The Biodiversity of Life, I think. And of course, I'm like, oh, this is, this is you know, what he says we should do. And of course, because he's the father of social biology, he's the father of biodiversity, he, coined, he pretends that he coined the term. He's won the Pulitzer Prize <laughs> twice. He did, he did organize the meeting where the term was coined. It was actually coined by a, a, um, a, a bureaucrat who just wanted to make the word shorter, but anyway. He's won the Pulitzer Prize, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? He's a professor at Harvard. You know, he's, he's done all these things. So maybe we should just do what he says, right? Maybe he knows. Or maybe more tree is actually good for something. So maybe more evolution, more tree, more biodiversity measured that way on the planet is actually good for something. Not a trivial question. You might assume it is, which I did in 92 and all the way through, um, but it might not be true. And it's quite contentious. So this is a picture of a very famous site in Minnesota, David Tillman Cedar Creek Plots. And this, I don't know how many papers have been written about this one little plot here, where people have tried to do experiments to figure out whether more species are better. Are more species, if you have more plant species growing in your field, do you get more stuff out of the field? Do you get fewer weeds in your field? Does your field sort of uh, um, doesn't change as much from year to year? All these sorts of things that we think might be good um, have been tested using these plots. And so they're plotted with like three species, local species, six species, 12 species, 16 species, et cetera, et cetera. And so up to 24, I think most of the uh, uh, research is done by up to 24 species. And you find out that usually more species actually gives you a better outcome, measured in different ways. This man, Mark Cadot, uh, who's a Canadian um, from northern, northern Ontario, he said, well, wait a minute. OK, we can count the number of species, but why don't I just build the trees and see whether tree length, total evolution, also predicts how well these plots do. And he found out that tree length, if he took the number of species in the plot, took their DNA out, built a tree, and then asked, okay, how, much, how many millions of years uh, uh, of evolution is in that plot? It was a vastly better predictor of productivity at the end of the season, that was a, that's, that's what they measured, um, than, any, than 13 other measures that you could measure, including species richness. And he's like, oh, okay. Then he went and looked at 29 global experiments. So, so Tillman's been doing this from the 70s and 80s, and then the Europeans got involved, and uh, African groups got involved, and so there's lots of experiments of the same ilk. Again, he found that tree length, built the trees by himself, and found that uh, tree length was a vastly better predictor of productivity. Then he did an experiment a couple years ago just outside of Toronto where he actually manipulated, kept the number of species the same in the plots, but changed how closely related they were. So instead of putting two chimps together, you make sure you put a chimp and an orangutan together and see whether those plots did better. Again, he found um, that tree length predicted something that was good. There are lots of other papers that have done that. There was a very um, uh, influential review in Nature magazine, that same magazine that, uh, that I talked about that had the story, that suggested that this was an important emerging trend. So case closed. And so what we thought, OK, well, this is um, interesting, but this is very local. right? So we've been talking about all birds of the world, all mammals of the world, and talking about isolation. But is there a relationship between uh, global isolation, as measured, right, looking at the Hoatzin and, and uh, the oil bird and such like, and what happens at a local scale? So what we did, this is again with Dave Redding and some, uh, and some other uh, authors, is we took a whole bunch, because we had the bird tree, didn't have a plant tree, we took a whole bunch of uh, bird assemblages, so where birds live. So a, which birds live here? Which birds live here? Which birds live here? Over 
over uh, 20 or 30 years. And then we built the tree of those birds. Then we uh, went back and we said, well, how much, just like in the plot, just like what Mark did, we said, well, how much uh, evolution is there in each assemblage? Right? So we just record the total numbers of millions of years in that particular place of birds. And then we said, OK, let's pretend that we did a really bad job of prioritization. And, we got, and what we lost were the globally most isolated species from each plot. Right? So we took the 500 most globally isolated species from this tree, and we said, OK, let's pretend they went extinct in all the plots. And then go back to the plots and say, well, how much would we lose in that plot? And on average, we lose about 550 million years of evolution in any given plot. And then we said, OK, what if we removed the same number of species randomly? So not the most isolated ones, just extinction was random. And in fact, you lose about half. So there's a huge difference. That means that even if you take a global isolation measure, you actually have an effect. You're, you're actually preserving local isolation and local total tree, I should say. So that seemed to make sense. That's great. So as I said, should be case closed. However, a lot of people really don't think we can extrapolate from a three by three square of annual uh, flowers to making decisions about conservation. Right? They really worry that the scale is just wrong. And so this, though some people say, oh, we've done it. Uh, other people say, this is not a reason to use the tree to make decisions about conservation, especially in a triage situation. So that is not cut and dry. Second reason why it might be, um, make sense to focus on these isolated species has to do with option value. So what is option value? You don't really know what option value is. It's an economics term. It goes back to the 64. Um, but I can tell you what economists say it is. Option value is some sort of benefit. So they turn it as a non-user benefit. It's not something you use now, but it's associated with something you think you might need in the future. You don't know if you need it in the future, but you think you might need it in the future. Um, and if you find out that you need it and you don't have it, it's going to cost you a lot to replace it. And of course, if things go extinct, it could cost a lot to replace it. And five years ago, we would have said extinction is forever. Now we can store the DNA. Who knows what we can do, but it will definitely be expensive. So the idea is that what we should do is preserve those things that may have high option value. And the, the poster child for this idea, or at least in my mind, uh, is the gastric brooding frog. It's extinct. Two species, they're both gone. We're never going to get them back. Uh, I shouldn't say that. There is some DNA, and there are people trying to breed them back. There are people trying to engineer them, but they haven't done it yet. Um, this is the male, and the male actually brooded the baby inside his stomach. And people, uh, they're Australian, and people now, as soon as they went extinct, they're like, oh my goodness, we need to know about the chemicals in his stomach that allowed that baby not to be turned into food. Right? It was a, something that would have been really interesting to know about. Um, it's too late now. So the idea, and this goes back to Dan Faith, back to 1992 as well, that species that contribute most, more to father genetic diversity, the isolated ones, should have higher option value because they are likely to embody features, things, like being able to have a baby in your tummy, that, is, that aren't found elsewhere by virtue of the fact that they don't have any close relatives. Right? So they may be useful in the future. So we should preserve a really wide range because we don't know what we might need. That's at least one way of thinking about option value. The other cool thing about the Hoatzin, I didn't tell you about, it's also called the stink bird because it's the only bird that lives like a cow. So the number one lives like a bat. This one lives like a cow. It actually ferments its food. So it's a great big gut. It's very big. It eats, and then it ferments its food just like a cow does, just like all ruminants do. No other bird does this. And so again, here's something from the US Department of Energy's Joint Genome Institute where they say, taking advantage of the similarity between the Hoatzin foregut and the cow ruminants, that's a bird, that's a mammal, researchers want to sequence the microbial communities in the bird's crop using methods established for termite hindguts. They hope to identify novel enzymes that can break down plant cell walls for biofuel applications. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, nobody would have thought that we might want to look at bird gut enzymes to solve climate change, right? That's kind of the idea. That's the nugget. It's not uh, 
particularly formal, but that's the nugget of option value. Option value makes a very strong prediction. That prediction is that the more isolated you are, the more traits you have that are different from everyone else, right? You're more different. It just means that the tree tells you that you're more different. The more different you are on the tree, the more different you are in the traits that you have, the features that, that Faith talked about. So there should be a positive relationship between how isolated you are in time and how isolated you are in how you look. So we thought we would test that, right? So we took birds. We measured a whole bunch of things. You know, are they nocturnal? Are they diurnal? How big are they? What do they eat? Where do they live? And we said, OK, there's got to be a, positive, a relationship. And in fact, there is not a positive relationship. This is the same 2,000 species of bird that we looked at in North America. And there's the Hwatsin way out there in North and South America. There's the Hwatsin. Very isolated. Pretty weird. But, the, but the, actually, the, the, based on the traits that we looked at, the weirdest bird is actually the Rhea, which is also isolated, but not as isolated as, as the Hwatsin. This does not give us comfort that, in general, the option value argument works. I didn't believe it, so I did it for mammals. Same thing, nothing there. I think it's because we're not measuring the right traits. I think we have too few traits, and we're not measuring them. However, that's easy to say. This was the motivator for the whole enterprise. I think we have to stay tuned. So this is ongoing research, I should say. It's ongoing research in our lab and in uh, other labs. OK. So the motivator here, for me, was this idea that when I went home, it just didn't look as interesting as it used to. right? And that's nostalgia. I mean, that's a cherche de temperature, that's the whole thing. I mean, that's just me getting old. But it is true that these things are not on the farm. And there's nothing else really like them. Well, there are some other frogs, but there's nothing else really like them uh, on the farm either. They actually were locally very distinctive. At the local scale, they were distinctive. right? Just like we were looking at the plots. Black bear is not distinctive globally, but on my farm, there's no other types of bear. There's no, there are no grizzly bears or polar bears. So the idea of scale, I think, is really important. So here is the 200 mammals, species of mammal in Canada. This is their isolation, just as a frequency in bins, and this is the number of species. So most species are not isolated in Canada, and some species are very isolated in Canada. The most isolated species of mammal in Canada actually isn't the beaver. It's the mountain beaver, not related to the beaver at all. Also lives here on the west coast. And it's actually number nine in the world. So there's one in Abbotsford. There's a couple in Abbotsford, actually, up in the, up on the, in the hills there. Uh, very few people have seen them. Very strange little beast. Uh, uh, it is a rodent, um, but it's not a beaver. Um, but that's globally. If we did, like, like just look at my mom's farm or look at a plot, and we said, well, just in that plot, who's the most isolated? We can just build the trees for all the species in Canada. So now this is ignoring relatives elsewhere. So this is mammalian evolutionary isolation in Canada, where we don't care if they've got close relatives elsewhere. Now, the most isolated species is actually the Virginia opossum, because it's the only marsupial, right? It's actually number 355 in the world, but in Canada, it's number one, because it's not related to anything else in Canada. It's the only marsupial. All right, this is the quiz that I've done before. What do you think is the second most isolated species of mammal in the world? I think Dan knows at the back. What's number two in the world? In, in Canada, sorry. What's the, number, what's the second most isolated uh, mammal in Canada? Going once. Rabbit. Rabbit would not, be, if it wasn't for the pika, Pika would have been a good choice. Rabbit would not have been a bad choice. It's actually not distantly related from rabbits. It's the human. It's the only, we're the only primate that lives in Canada, right? So the scale, now we're actually, we're actually pretty much the same as the polar bear, right up right there with the polar bear on the, on, on the, at the global scale. But in the Canadian context, we're actually the second most isolated mammal in Canada. Uh, this, is just to say that the scale at which you think about this makes all the difference. And so I think that we have to be um, thoughtful about how we think about valuing species. And I think scale is probably the most, one of the most important things that we have to consider. I put up the barn owl here, um, because the barn owl, not particularly uh, isolated uh, worldwide, but is number two in Canada if we don't look uh, at relatives elsewhere. It's also um, threatened. 
with extirpation in Canada. It's doing well elsewhere, but not necessarily in Canada. So the scale that you look at will change um, how you value bits of biodiversity. So I think uh, I started with this idea that, that uh, this was motivated by um, the idea of what we should let go. But I hope I've convinced you that really what I'm talking about is what not to let go, right? We have to make sure that we don't make mistakes. So I'm not advocating, much as, as some people, uh, or sometimes when I'm um, uh, trying to egg people on, I suggest that we actually battlefield triage is something we should think about, and maybe we have to think about it, but what I am talking about is the other kind of triage, where you have to make sure that you treat the patients that are most important first. And I don't want to get into a situation where we miss something, like the tailed frog, for instance, because we didn't pay attention to this aspect of that species value. So, which, ber which bear should have higher priority? Should it be the panda bear that's in the zoo, or should it be the polar bear that's in nature? Now, this is where I should stop, right? With a rhetorical question, open it up, and all this stuff, right? This is the right time to stop. But I'm not going to. <laughs> There's a coda. And I, and, and I don't know why I've decided to tell you this, but I'm telling you this. There's a coda. And the coda is that I have painted a picture of me and all my friends losing our hair, wearing glasses, and trying to decide who should be saved, who should go first, who should not go on the ark, who should go on the ark. This actually was uh, drawn based on a paper that Mark Cadott uh, uh, published on some of these topics. Um, so I suggested that, I've suggested that this is where we are or may end up being, but it's not somewhere, somewhere where I am comfortable. And so I want to end with this. And this is something that has been bothering me. And I just want to open it up for uh, discussion. So species are distinct lineages in the tree of life. And some of them are going to be more useful to us than others, right? The more interesting among them have utility on their own. They have utility because we find them interesting, or they may have utility for other reasons. If we keep them on the landscape, which is why I showed you the panda and the polar bear, that may if they're doing well on the landscape, that may indicate that the landscape is doing well, right? And if we manage them well, that may lead to sound landscape management. But the thing that's been always puzzled me, and I ask lawyers and philosophers and everybody, is why we chose indicators of sound landscape management or landscapes, why they were given such a central place in a dialogue about managing our affairs more globally. And as philosophers, now that I'm over 45, I can start to read philosophy. Philosophers like Norton and Mayer more recently keep reminding us nature is not a warehouse. And everything I've told you pretty much is predicated on the idea that nature's there for us and it's a warehouse. With that, I hope we can turn off the lights and we can start to take questions. What a lecture, and now we all know why we feel isolated. <laughs> um, I've never seen a lecture before where at the end of the lecture you deconstruct everything you've said. I said I don't know why I did a it. Courageous, a courageous move, but I'm sure a provocative lecture that must have provoked some ideas and questions in your part. Heather has a microphone, and if you indicate uh, your desire to pose a question or make a comment that uh, Dr. Morris could respond to. Uh, we'll try to get the microphone to you over here. Thank you for the presentation. Um, you didn't state uh, why you need to prioritize species in the first place, although I, I did listen to your CBC interview the other day, and you mentioned that because we have uh, limited resources for conservation, that's what we need to do. So by resources, did you mean wealth and capital? Is that what you, is that correct? Like money, essentially? <laughs> Apologies. Um, I think, yes. So money is a good way to measure how interested we are in something. So it's the amount of resources we're willing to spend collectively to look after, to manage our affairs. Maybe we shouldn't stick with it. We should go back to it. Okay, so um, resources and capital are human inventions. 
Mm-hmm. And they're derived from converting living organisms and their habitats into commodities. Mm-hmm. And as you know, that's the normal functioning of a capitalist growth economy. And I think that concept has relevance to this talk because if we ignore the context of extinctions, which as you know is habitat destruction and a few other things, I don't think it'll matter, you know, how unique species are, what we decide to prioritize, or what methodology we use. I think they're all gone if we don't address those root causes. So I, um, I, 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 at one point, made a sidehead remark that um, I have a hammer and that's what I'm using. So economists and uh, social scientists have to tell us how we can manage our affairs in a different way if we want to do a good job at managing our affairs. The subtext, why I brought up zoos and things, and one of the things that Wilson talks about um, at length is that he's thinking about some of this uh, prioritization in a different context, something about in terms of tree of life specifically, is a stopgap to make sure we don't lose anything until we get our house in order. So it's a last ditch attempt to keep what, what may be important bits for the future. And then, of course, the question comes up, what do, you, what do I mean by important? And that is sort of uh, beyond my pay scale at this point. But, <laughs> but I think that's the, the sort of the next level of the question. Okay, I, think, I just have one thing to add. I just sure. find it quite dangerous to, to suggest that species should have to, have to pay for themselves for particular right from the outset. I think that's really dangerous so I don't think I okay. So everyone heard what she said. She said that that I'm, I'm our science, our people who think it this way, putting the onus on species to pay for themselves. And um, I, I'm not sure exactly how to respond to that, except to say that that um, we know we're prob- we know we're not going to save everything. We just know that no matter how uh, uh, benign and enlightened we become um, in the short term. And so we just want to make sure that we don't lose some things that may turn out to be more important than other things. But you can say the whole thing, and, and that's, why, that's kind of why I put this up, actually. So you can say that the whole enterprise is flawed from the beginning, absolutely flawed from the beginning. We have to start you know, with a, a start carte blanche with a whole new way of thinking, even as scientists, to help inform the public about what we should be doing. And I, um, I do take that point. Question or comment over here? Well, Harmon, you forgot you forgot the Sasquatch. And I have many colleagues as conservation biologists who actually do research on that species. So uh, more unique than you, Anthony. So, um, I feel less but, isolated. <laughs> <laughs> um, as a conservation biologist who works on many of the uh, most isolated species mm-hmm. and the least charismatic species in the Pacific Northwest, including mountain beaver. Mm-hmm. Uh, the struggle that I have is that the priorities of many of the funders that ensure that conservation works can actually happen are not on those species. And there's a big struggle there. There's a huge disparity because even many of the regulators that I work with um, in the provincial and federal government are focused on probably the ones that have redundancy. So. They're not focused on the mountain beavers of the world and others. And it's very difficult to get funding support to ensure that we're taking a multi-species approach, that landscape level approach, that isn't about creating a warehouse. So if I can help help you, I would love to help you. But I I would hope that, I think one of the things, the more more you tell people, so if you saw, an, if you happen to see an oil bird in a zoo, it just looks like a chicken-sized brown bird. But if someone tells you about how amazing it is, you're going to be more interested in it. So that's you know the facile answer is that if you can explain to people why we should be worried about the mountain beaver, more interested in the mountain beaver, maybe that will ha- um, uh, hold some sway. It's only if you get funding to actually have that conversation, and that's the struggle. Well, that gets back to the the, the first question is about where, why do we spend what we spend and where do we spend it? That's a, as I say, that's a much bigger question. There's a comment or question back over here. Uh, yeah, 
Um, I was just wondering, in terms of like, you, you, you speak about, I know it's oversimplification, obviously, for a presentation, but in terms of like, um, again, to sort of kind of distill a sense of evolution, adaptation, or transformation from a direct length of the, the yep. branch. Yep. But say the polar example, you can say that it has solved an incredibly novel evolutionary issue. It's the only marine um, mammal of, of, in, in, of all bears. And so, um, or for instance, hominids. We now say that hominids are endangered, becoming extinct. And yet, an incredible range of hominids, you can say, have solved some fascinating um, evolutionary issues. So, I guess, is there a way forward for um, identifying not just sort of the coarse genetic distance, but more specifically the um, I guess quality uh, genetic distance and how they should be solved? Yeah. <clears throat> so, that is the kind of $20,000 question. I've used time, right? I showed you those trees that go back 110 million years, and I've been telling you about isolation measured in millions of years. And then I showed you that actually doesn't really work for the few traits that we looked at for birds or mammals. There were a few traits, but it didn't seem to work. So um, the question is, can we come up with better metrics? And if we can, great. So now I'm interested in looking at the entire genomes and looking at the information in that genome. And if we do that, maybe the polar bear will pop out, pop out as being a little bit more isolated than, than it would otherwise be. And maybe not. And if it doesn't, and we still have this uncomfortable feeling that we're not catching something that is important, then we've got to go back to the bench and try to think about how we can do that. So it's still early days of trying to actually capture the, the metric. And the only reason I use time is because I find it very useful and fungible because you can talk about uh, you know, frogs and fish and mammals and birds using the same measuring stick. Whereas if you use traits, it would be, it would, it would be very, very difficult. It would be very hard. They would really be apples and oranges. So it simplifies the discussion, but it maybe uh, complexifies the actual issue. Thank you so much, Jenny, for your knowledge. My question is, I'm interested in the food and another variety of agricultural seeds which are now stored in Norway yep. to save yep. the DNA model. Is there something similar to which can be done for the birds? And oh. since, yeah, then I was wondering also that quotation, nature is not aware of. I mean, not all becoming warehouses like the big cities which have grown up from the rural, that people are not living in warehouses, zoos uh, become a warehouse. So I don't know the matter for warehouse. Yes. <coughs> right. So two things. Are there um, tissue, plas tissue repositories for um, birds and mammals? The answer is yes, they're frozen often, but you can just dry them. So that's why I'm saying that there was a little bit of of tissue, forget what it was, for the gastric brooding frog, and they're trying to coax that back. Um, but the, old, the stuff that's already gone, they didn't think really about preservation, but now people are actually having tissue banks for lots of things. So lots of museums, museums are doing that. Uh, I like the metaphor of a warehouse. Um, I like it because it makes us, really has, it's very evocative. I think zoos are warehouses, it's specifically, and I, so that's why I like it, because it makes us think about what a zoo is, really. Right? And what's it for? Um, uh, the, whether we live in warehouses uh, because we're in cities versus in the rural, that brings up the whole living in the city and the walls of the city and nature, which, is, which um, I hadn't thought about thinking about warehouses in that context, but it might make it an even richer, a richer metaphor. But I like it as a metaphor, for sure. There's a comment question up here. An emeritus faculty member from SFU. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for that talk. Very interesting. I'd like to to ask two questions. <laughs> the first is, E.O. Wilson said to preserve the information. Okay. It's now possible to uh, record genomes completely. Digitally. Digitally. Yes. As a matter of fact, if you want to record them digitally, one of the digital storage methods is uh, to make a uh, DNA or RNA chain. That's right. Yeah. And Craig Redner has done yeah. this with uh, uh, Shakespeare and yep. so forth. The other question is that, and I'd like you to, to uh, comment on that, sure. explain what I'm saying. Uh, the other one is that the numbers you gave sort of bother me. I do know a little bit about how these 
how these links are put into years. And I've always wondered how you can get an 80 million year horizon for uh, primates when there was a bottleneck back there uh, 65 million years ago. Also, do evolutionary uh, speeds, are they affected by mutagens? A uh, mutagenic environment might have varied over that time too. So your comments on those would be appreciated. Sure. So the comment about um, <coughs> Wilson suggesting that we have to conserve the information content, we could just do that by either having a seed bank or having a bit of tissue or even just having something on a computer. Right? That would be the information. And, and, and that makes us think about zoos, right? We take the animals out of the natural environment and put them in zoos. Well, that's just one step towards having just keeping that information content. So the more we learn about the genome and how it works, now we can't do it because of all the epigenetics and, and all the tagging and all that sort of thing. But it would, it's conceivable that we could take a computer printout and recreate something, right? It's possible. And at that point, there'll be a discussion about what Wilson actually meant. But we're not there yet. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't think about it. Um, the time element on the timing of the tree, uh, so the question is, well, how do, we, how do we actually know that all living mammals actually shared a common ancestor 150 million years ago? Uh, that has been one of the barriers to managers taking up this um, approach, I think, and maybe some of my colleagues in the audience might have something to say about that. I think we are getting better. I think um, the ones that are very isolated, it's not going to matter. Because we knew that back with Linnaeus, because they they're in their own family, or they're in their own order. Right? It doesn't matter what the DNA says. The, the uh, ranking, like are humans more or less isolated than polar bears, I agree with you, we probably don't know. So, but the top ones, I think we're OK. And they're the ones that I really want to concentrate on and saying we just make sure we don't lose those. So, but the first one I think is a really is a very interesting question about what do we mean when we say conservation? Is a zoo enough? Is a piece of tissue enough? Is a flash drive enough? Right? Uh, so one over here, but I'm just looking at a question while we go over there because I, I can't resist with the opportunity. Um, does it make, I mean, it's, I don't care if this question is ethical, about ethics or not, but does it make a difference to you as to whether or not the extinction or threatened extinction is by virtue of human agency as opposed to natural evolutionary factors? And I guess what I was wondering is, if diversity is the value, do you favor, if, 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 if science allows, should we be bringing back dinosaurs and things? Um, and for me, at least, intuitively, it seems different to say we should bring back the species that we were directly responsible as humans to, uh, to, to cause to be extinct, as, a, as opposed to a species that may have died out due to natural evolutionary factors. So how does that play into your thinking? Uh, so this argument is uh, completely silent on that value judgment. We're saying, this is the issue. We saved those. Um, the ethical issues associated with bringing things back or the, the quagmire that's associated with doing things like that um, is a whole different discussion um, that is tangentially related to this one. But this doesn't, doesn't, we don't care whether it's, if it's just information, then we should save the, informa save the information that we've got. Now remember, they're solved evolutionary problems. So, so you could make an argument that if it's gone extinct naturally, didn't solve those problems. So we should leave it be. But I, I, I'm not super comfortable with that, but I could hide behind that, um, that, that, that argument. And we have a question over here. Uh, first, thank you very much for your important work. Um, I'm wondering if you can compare to randomness. Those yeah, random. that's right. Are we essentially random today in the way that we do things? When you, when you say talk yeah. about randomness, not today? Right. right. So, so I was comparing how much, how much would we save if we were uh, uh, deliberate about it versus what, what, how much would we save if we were random about it. So it turns out that uh, we're certainly not random, but we're, we're arbitrary. So most money to conservate, so supposedly we're supposed to use all these different metrics to come up with where we put our money. It doesn't turn out that way. We spend most of our money on very few things. And um, the reasons are very uh, obscure as to how, obscure to us as to how those allocations were made. So there are political decisions, there are 
media decisions, there are, as you know, there are cuddly decisions, there's you know, all, all, sorts of, all sorts of considerations that go in. So um, I wouldn't call it random, but I certainly, it's certainly not deliberate. Um, at the margins, it's deliberate, but it's not overall deliberate. I have, first of all, a couple of comments. First of all, you said this was your first ever public lecture, and yes. I would suggest that you continue to do so. <laughs> <laughs> On my research, yeah, exactly. <laughs> on my research. Secondly, uh, you mentioned something that was above your pay scale. Yes. I would suggest that if you continue to present uh, President Petter as 12.5 million years old, you can surround all of you and have no pay scale. Can you talk about, can you tell us, we're talking about predicted yes. extinction factors. Yes. Can you talk about going back a thousand years or 10,000 years and extinctions have always occurred? Animals or innocent have disappeared. Yeah. We have fossil record. Are we in an era where they are having much faster? Or, or following up on, on a question by Dr. Penner, where are we on this continuum? Are we increasing <coughs> massively? And should we work, if you're talking about triage, perhaps we should simply triage a certain species of homo, which might then uh, release many of the pressures on all those species. So, <laughs> thank you for those comments. Uh, there is. <coughs> There is, there is an organization called the Voluntary uh, Human Extinction Movement. Uh, you can look at, you can find it on the web. Uh, so people have talked about that. Uh, I don't think it's going to fly. Um, going back in time, so this is so, so there's no question that the, there's no question that if we even look at the number of birds and mammals that have gone extinct since 1600 to now, and we compare that with how much evolution has accrued between the year 1600 and now, uh, we're, orders of, we're losing orders of magnitude more than we're gaining. Um, now the extinction, the, the sort of current mass extinction actually isn't just from the 16, from 1600 on, it goes back quite a ways before. So humans have had uh, an impact um, for uh, thousands of years and, and di people di differ in when they think it really started. Um, but we have lost a lot of um, large things that were our competitors and we got rid of them um, almost everywhere that we went as soon as we got there. So we've been doing it for a long time. We're just very good at doing it now. We're very, we're very good. And these are projections, right? So we, these are things that are at risk. We already know how many, so six, uh, order of 50 to 100 uh, bird species, maybe thousands of bird species have gone extinct just since 1600. So we know that that's way higher than, than is being replenished by evolution. Um, but whether it's 100 times or 1,000 times or 10,000 times depends very much on the model that you use because it's all kind of predictive, postdictive, what's the rate of speciation, how old are species. But, um, and then the question is whether it's accelerating or not. And that, I also don't want to um, make any grand claims. There are many people who say it is accelerating. Uh, climate change is really an unknown. So some people think, oh, well, if it wasn't accelerating before, it's gonna be accelerating, it's accelerating now. Uh, but I, I think that, you know, prediction, you know, predicting the future is hard, right? So uh, it's, it's higher than it has been, and it's due to us. That much I can say. And it's, high, it's higher enough that we should be really concerned about um, what's going on. I don't know, for 70 years ago, I was a little boy. And then one of the first stories I ever read was called Belly and the Cat. Do you know what? Belly and the Cat. You don't know the story. It's about a bunch of mice, and they were afraid of the cat. And they all got together, and they decided they would put a bell on the cat's neck. And they thought about this, and they talked about it. And finally, when I old Bob says, but who will put the bell on the cat? And I want to know for you, how would I put the bell on the cat? When you think of the diversity of human nature and the diversity of political systems that we live under and so on. So who's actually going to, who, who's going to take charge of doing all this hard work? Uh, I think that's, a, that's actually a very good question. And that's why I talked about scale. So, so we do have this, in, this international organization that says these are globally endangered species, but that, translating that into action is difficult because it's up to uh, communities and countries to actually spend the money. So um, environmental aid, uh, NGOs, international NGOs, uh, non-governmental organizations, they actually do concentrate on globally endangered species. Uh, the EDGE program, which uh, Andrew referred to, terrible name, evolutionarily distinct globally endangered, but it's edge, edge of, ex edge of existence, um, that actually are raising money to focus on these birds and mammals and amphibians that are both uh, at risk and isolated. Um, they're doing it globally, um, but most of the action is done 
at the local, regional, uh, and national level. And that's why we have to think hard about how we, uh, what, what we talk about and what's important where, especially in the context of, the, of, of isolation. I think everyone's going to do it. Everyone has to do it. Uh, just a, a quick comment and then one question. Um, it seems as though the wager of this descriptive program of yours is that the prime value of species is its phylogenetic diversity. And I think a lot of people may <coughs> take offense to that who are scientists for the, for the following reason. Um, there are many species that you would place on a very low rung mm -hmm. on the scale of value. But these species we know by structuring roles within ecosystems. And the loss of them would result in cascades of other species. Right there, just that on its own, suggests to me that there's something a little bit wrong with this way of viewing the world. It's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also a sense in which there is no ark, there is no warehouse. Species need space, habitat. And very importantly, they need other species. And so, I guess in this context of uh, scarce resources, you really have to make an argument that we should be taking on your type of way of seeing the world, and, and also convince us that it's not just distracting conservation biologists from the true goal of reversing you know, a lot of these major big causes. So I would uh, agree with most of what you said. Most of what you said. Um, I, 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 when I started the talk, I said, this, I'm going to tell you about one value. And it's, uh, I hope I said, I'm not claiming that's the most important value that you describe. And it's very difficult to make these values fungible, such as you can say, well, you know, it's high on this scale uh, on isolation, um, but it's low on the scale of an ecosystem engineer, for instance, or something that sits, sits a, a, at a critical place. One of the things we don't know is, is what the correlation is between those two. So top predators in an environment tend to be very isolated in that environment, uh, evolutionarily isolated in that environment. As you know, top, top predators also tend to have, uh, have a sort of strong, play a strong role in the ecological structuring of those of, of the places in which they live. So there may be a correlation, there may not be a correlation. Um, certainly, I'm not suggesting that we throw away species just because they have close relatives. It's not what to let go, it's what not to let go. What I'm saying is we have to make sure we don't lose species that we didn't know were valued highly on this scale. And that's a different way of thinking about it. So it's provocative, that's why I called it what to let go, because it's provocative, but I don't think we should, I don't think you, we should, we should be careful, or I should be careful not to tell you, to have you leave here thinking that what I'm saying is we should let some species go extinct just by virtue of the fact that they're in a genus with 100 other finches, doesn't really matter. Now, to the extent that that graph I showed you was wrong and distinctive species are different and species that aren't distinctive or aren't isolated uh, aren't different, then we can let one finch go, another finch will come in and take its place in the economy of nature. That is a prediction. That is a testable prediction. All that said, this is not about, this is about, this is about thinking about the, 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 the pieces, the species not about where they sit in the economy of nature. It's about making sure we don't lose those pieces. How we deal with landscapes and ecosystems and the interactions between species is another axis of conservation biology. So they're complementary, not com competing. 